Okay, welcome to the final talk of this section of the program uh, before we go off for a break. Uh, we're going to hear about music theory with Sebastian and Cherney by James Tauber. This is a 25, oh, sorry, it's a 30 minute bracket, 25 minutes of James talking and five minutes of questions at the end. Uh, please make James welcome. Thank you very much, Richard, and thank you, everyone. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is a couple of uh, open source Python projects that I've been working on, on and off for a number of years, relating to music, uh, Sebastian and, and Cherney. And uh, th there are certain idiosyncrasies, I guess, to the approach that I take to these, these kinds of things. Um, my background uh, academically is as a linguist, so I tend to bring a, a, a lot of that to the way I think about uh, to music theory. Um, you, you'll see traces of that throughout, I suspect. I want to start off by thinking about music creation uh, in terms of almost like a network stack. Um, at the top, you've got a, a composer who has some idea and she'll either consciously or unconsciously craft that idea in terms of various components, abstract musical objects, that then eventually uh, get output uh, uh, generally in the form of a score. Um, I like to think of the score as, as almost like the object code. The, the real source code of music are these abstract musical objects, the, the, the components. Um, you know, the score is typically performed and there's a, a tremendous amount that a performer adds to the score uh, in, in their performance. A lot of interpretation, in many cases trying to interpret the ideas of the composer as well as introducing some of their own. And you know, you're listening to that performance or perhaps a recording of that, component, uh, that, uh, that performance. So there are various technologies that exist at, at, at those layers to describe what's going on. Um, in, in the score world, there's a wonderful open source project called LilyPond for representing scores. People may not necessarily think of MIDI as being about performance, but that's essentially what it is. A MIDI file is telling you when a particular node is played when and, and, and how. Um, so, so that's as, uh, you know, it has uh, limitations, but it's certainly in that layer. Um, and then we have things like WAV files for actually representing the, the recording. Now, just to sort of scope what I'm going to be talking about, uh, Sebastian is primarily concerned with the relationship between these abstract musical components and, uh, and the score, and to a lesser extent, uh, how that then relates to an actual performance in, in terms of a, of a MIDI file. Uh, Cherney has to do with the relationship between a score and a performance. So you'll notice that neither of those get down to the actual layer of the audio, and that's, that's important to point out. This isn't a talk at all about uh, synthesis or sampling or anything like that in terms of producing audio, nor is it about analyzing audio. It's, it's about analyzing performance, producing scores, that kind of thing, so those, those high layers. So the first project I'm going to talk about is called Sebastian, named after Johann Sebastian Bach, one of my favorite composers and, and you know, certainly considered one of the greatest of all time. Um, and the, the idea of Sebastian is to really explore the representation of these abstract music ideas in Python so that you can both uh, use, that, use Python as a composition tool, but also as a tool for understanding uh, existing pieces of music. So in, in, in a sort of constructivist way where you're, you're, you're trying to use Python to build some existing piece rather than necessarily taking an existing piece and, and, and breaking it apart. Uh, one way I describe uh, Sebastian is that it's sort of like Mathematica for, for music. That's sort of my end goal anyway. Music is often described as mathematical. What people often mean by that is that uh, it's very numerical. There's you know, ratios of frequencies and stuff like that. And you know, the Greeks were big into that. It continued into to medieval times. That's not really what I'm particularly interested in here. I, I'm more interested in a sort of algebraic, symbolic view of how you manipulate these various abstract objects. Now, there are a few uh, interesting characteristics that music have, uh, has that uh, is an input to how you would represent these in Python data structures and, and manipulate them. One characteristic is that, that music uh, can be very repetitive. It has a lot of um, reuse. 
Okay, back on. Less hand waving, perhaps. Um, there's a lot of reuse, which lends itself well to putting uh, musical objects in variables and manipulating them in that way. Um, it has a real hierarchical structure to it. Pieces often have you know, multiple movements that have obvious sections that have phrasing and, and so on. So there's a hierarchical structure there. One of the other interesting things about music is that it combines uh, both a sequential notion of one note following another, but also the notion of what's going on simultaneously, what two notes are being played at the same time. So there's a need to model both that sequential and parallel structure. And particularly important, I think, for the approach that I'm, I'm taking with Sebastian is music's very factorable. You can take something like a, a piece of music, three blind mice, and if you like, factor out what key it's in. And there's a sense in which you can talk about three blind mice independent of the key that you factored out. Um, and related to that is this notion that I borrow from linguistics, something called underspecification, where uh, you don't always have all of the pieces of information that you are eventually going to need um, to produce the output, but you can uh, manipulate uh, those underspecified uh, data, um, data structures in various ways. A good example of that is you can talk about a, a major scale without necessarily knowing what key it's in. There's certain characteristics that a major scale has regardless of whether it's a C major scale or an F major scale or whatever. So just as a point of departure, um, to kind of give a, a, a simplified view of, of what we're going to do and then we're going to explore this a little further, one way that you could represent uh, what's going on in a musical uh, piece, certainly at a, a low level, almost this sort of object code level, is as a set of notes where each note is represented by a Python dictionary where you've got some offset that's telling you when the note's going to be played, you know, what pitch it's going to be played at for how long. Um, or you could take another approach where you use something like a Python list where the order matters. Uh, that means you don't need to worry about offsets. Um, it can rely on you know, the duration, perhaps, of one note determining when the, the next note will start. You might split out uh, the octave uh, from the pitch and so on. But coming back to some of those original uh, sort of modeling issues that I raised, if you consider something like uh, three blind mice and break it up into, put various parts of three blind mice into some variables, um, you might get something like this. The point of playing that, I don't necessarily want to get into the details, although you see later how each of those components was defined, but it's really just this sense of you're adding things together, you're multiplying stuff together, you're doing these operations, but you're doing them on, on musical objects um, to build up a piece um, even as simple as this. So coming to the whole question of the, the sequential versus parallel uh, structures, um, there's really three different ways that I uh, started to pursue for modeling a, a, a sequence of notes. And um, I ended up realizing that in various uh, applications, you need all three. So there's a notion of, of notes being specified or musical objects being specified in order, what I call a horizontal sequence. Um, there's also the notion of parallel notes or parallel uh, objects, uh, what I call a vertical sequence. And then, um, as we saw at the start, this notion of just putting offsets on each note so you know where they're going to appear. So in terms of implementing that in Python, the way that I, I, I do that is um, to basically have a, a class for each. It's very much like a list. It implements a very list-like uh, API. The horizontal, uh, horizontal sequence, if you remember, is where each element follows the next. So it's got a concatenate operator. You can take two H sequences and concatenate them together. Or you can um, call repeat, which will create a new H sequence with the given number of um, repetitions. And of course, with Python, because we can overload operators with dunder add and, and dunder mol, you can do things like a equals b times 2 plus c and actually manipulate these horizontal sequences, just like you saw with, with three blind mice. Now, with the vertical sequences, remember that each element is coincident. So we don't have a notion of concatenation between two vertical sequences. Instead, we have this notion that two things are played in parallel. So we merge them uh, together. And just sort of continuing this uh, overriding of, of methods, of, of operators, sorry, um, I actually use uh, floor div, which gives us this nice uh, double slash property to indicate that two things are parallel. So 
if, uh, if B and C are vertical sequences, we can say A equals B um, you know, parallel, played parallel to C. And then we have our O sequences, our offset-based sequences. Of course, when, when you are using some sort of offset property in a note to uh, say when it's going to get played, um, then you, know, you need to decide, well, what sort of units of time are you talking about? Uh, so one of, so O sequence is not a class, it's actually a, 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 a function, uh, a factory function that returns a class. You give the function, what am I going to use for my offset um, attribute and my duration attribute, and it returns a class that's going to use those attributes. And O sequences actually uh, implement the interface of both a horizontal sequence and a vertical sequence, because you can use an O sequence for both. All sequences you can create by passing in existing sequences. As I said, they're list-like, so you've got things like get item and, and len, um, and equals and not equals. It's always important in Python if you implement done to equals to also implement done to not equals. It can get you into a lot of trouble if you forget to implement uh, not equals as well. You can't assume just because you've overridden equals that uh, not equals will work. Um, but importantly, sequences have this notion of a, of a transform, a function that you can apply to the sequence to get a new sequence. And again, following this sort of uh, domain-specific language, almost, uh, almost like approach, um, I set the done to or to equal transform. So you can pipe these together in a Unix-like way, uh, pipe these transforms, rather than having these deeply nested function calls, even though that's essentially what they are, um, you're piping these together. So you could have a, a, a sequence in, in B, you could transpose it up five semitones and reverse it, and so on. So they're the three types of sequences. The actual individual objects in one of these sequences is, is what I call points. Um, and this is where the underspecification comes in. I handle underspecification with dictionaries. So you can have, for, for these individual points in a sequence might not know what their duration is. So you could just have a sequence of melodies without knowing how long each one's going to last. Or you could express a rhythm as a series of durations without a pitch. Or you could express um, melodies independent of key uh, by saying what degree in the key each node is. Um, so this, this underspecification is an important point. But what you can always do is, is what's called in linguistics unification, where you can take two dictionaries and as long as they don't conflict, you can merge, merge the uh, key values together. And there's an example of that at the bottom where, where something with a pitch and an octave but not a duration is unified with something with just a duration. So how do we represent pitch? Um, there's a number of different approaches you can take. You can use note names. You obviously then need to express an octave. Uh, MIDI uses its own numerical system for indicating pitch. Um, a music researcher, uh, William Hewlett, came up with a, a, another system. Um, I use my own system. The important point is that there's no one way you have to use. You can do transforms to convert between any of them. And you'll see later on when I give an example of how you can do something in the abstract and then at the end sort of make it more concrete by converting it to MIDI pitch. I won't go into too much detail about my own uh, pitch system, but basically it, it's, it's based on a uh, circle of fifths. And one of the nice properties that it has is it can distinguish uh, say a, a G sharp from a, 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 an A flat, they get represented by a different, a different number, which is not true in the case of MIDI pitch. And that's important for a lot of uh, applications. Now, you can build up these objects by specifying pitch and duration, and, but in many cases, it's much more convenient to use something like the lily pond language. So Sebastian includes a very simple lily pond uh, parser that can take these, uh, these sorts of uh, more compact instructions, and uh, that gets converted to uh, something like what you see at the bottom. And that's actually how, uh, going back here, these are the various sequences that were used in, in Three Blind Mice. So Sebastian includes um, a, a library for both parsing and generating MIDI files. Um, once you've built your, uh, your various musical objects, as long as they have a, a duration and a MIDI pitch and, and an offset, then uh, you can pass them through to write MIDI and output them as MIDI. So let me give uh, one example, um, one more example before I move on to, to Cherny. And that's how we might go about uh, building something uh, like an Alberti base. Alberti, uh, the Alberti base was very popular in, in the 18th century as a, something for the left, a, a way of a left, the left hand to play a, a chord. Um, it basically involves playing the, the, the first note, the, the fifth note, third note, fifth note of a, of a chord if it's in the, in the root position, 
This is a really good example, though, of the factorization and underspecification that I was talking about at the start. Um, here's an example. So this is an Alberti bass played 16 times over a C major chord. So we can capture the notion of what an Alberti bass means with this function. This says nothing about duration, rhythm, key, pitch, anything like that. All it says is, if you give me a triad, if you give me you know, three notes, I will return a horizontal sequence of the four notes that make up one of those dun 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 dun. So it's the first, the third, the, the second, and the, and the third. Um, then we need to introduce the notion of what a root triad is. So we can say, well, we're going we're gonna to start with a vertical sequence. Remember, a vertical sequence is notes played together. Um, consisting of the first degree, the third degree, and the fifth degree of the scale. So at this point, we haven't said anything about what key we're in or what duration the notes are being played or anything. We can introduce the notion of a quaver or an, an eighth note, as, as Americans refer to it as. Um, and then we can start to combine these together. So down the bottom, we can say this Alberti sequence is, is going to consist of a, a, a root triad played 16 times, and we're going to add the fact that it's a quaver. Um, but notice, even at this point, we still haven't said anything about what key or octave it's being played in. And that's really key to the whole way that, uh, no pun intended, to the way that um, Sebastian works, is you can manipulate all these objects under, in an underspecified way and then sort of add things later um, to, to make them more concrete. So we can define uh, what a C major key is. We can say we want to play it in that key um, in the fifth octave, and we can pass it through this transform MIDI pitch, which just goes through and works out what the MIDI pitch of each node is, um, which is what we require to be able to output as MIDI. So in terms of what's next for uh, Sebastian, um, I, I, I feel like Sebastian is kind of, uh, is kind of like I've, I've come to the point where the basic Lego blocks have been built, and now I just need to go and build a lot of Lego sets uh, out of it to make sure that you know, I've got the right pieces and so on. So there's going to be a lot of, of that next. Um, I want to make better use of MIDI input uh, to get stuff in, uh, more control over instruments in the MIDI output, um, better nesting of sequences for hierarchy, and also in the notion of what I'm calling a, a head point where you want to give properties to a whole sequence, not just each individual uh, note in that sequence. So that's Sebastian. Um, if anyone's uh, interested in sprinting on Sebastian, I'm hoping to do so on, on Monday and Tuesday during the sprints. It's uh, open source under an MIT license and, and available on GitHub. So moving on to Cherny. Cherny's a, a, a very different project. It's really focused on the notion of what's the difference between a score and the performance of that score. Uh, Cherny was a, a, a pianist. Um, uh, he actually studied with Beethoven and was famously Liszt's teacher. And as well as uh, performing as a pianist and, and writing a lot of uh, compositions, serious compositions of his own, he wrote a lot of piano exercises. And the real motivation for Cherny for me was being able to almost unit test my playing of piano exercises. So I could play a, a, a piano exercise by Cherny or anyone else on, on a keyboard and have it tell me how well I did. There's really two senses, though, in which there can be a difference between the score and the performance. There can be sort of a, a positive difference, which is what's the expression being added? That's an interesting, uh, I guess, research uh, avenue to pursue of what is it that the performer's adding in terms of the different ways that they're playing different notes. And then the negative notion of a difference, you know, what errors were, were made, what inconsistencies were there in the playing or unevenness. So first of all, we have to represent the performance. We do that as a sequence of events. MIDI seems like a, a reasonable thing to use for that. Um, and so how then do we represent the score? Well, the score is also really just a, another sequence of events. It's more just what the desired events are rather than what's actually played. And there's less information uh, typically there. So imagine that we've got a, um, a C major scale ascending then descending over, over uh, one octave. Um, I might represent the score for that just as a, a series of pairs of what note I'm playing and for how long. So that, uh, what you see on the right-hand side, is just the MIDI pitch and, uh, and the duration. And then actually record myself uh, playing it. Um, those of you who can read MIDI can follow along. 
So what Cherny can do is take that MIDI file and actually produce something uh, more like the score, where we've got offsets in, in ticks and then the MIDI pitch. And then what's being captured is the velocity, how loud the key is, or how hard the key is being pressed. And, and zero velocity indicates that the, the note uh, has stopped. So the first thing we actually do in Cherny is uh, take this series of, of start and stop and turn it into a single list of just um, when a note was played, how, uh, what note was played, how hard it was played, and for how long. And then we basically want to take a diff of these two things. The left hand side's the score, the right hand side's the performance. So in order to diff things, you need to align them. Um, and alignment is a dynamic programming problem um, that really relies on the notion of how, how um, much penalty do I have for adding things, for deleting things, and how do I score the similarity between two things? And once you work out those sorts of things, you can plug them into an algorithm uh, like the Needleman Wunsch algorithm, which is the one that I used, to actually get alignments of, of two uh, sequences. And that's exactly uh, what I did. So, how might we score the similarity between two notes? Um, one thing we could do is just say if the note's correct, we give it a one, and if the note's incorrect, we give it a zero. But you can be a little more advanced than that. You could say if you're only off by a semitone or tone, um, we'll give it half a, half a point. Um, this is not to do with the scoring of the performance. This is just used as a, as a heuristic for helping with the alignment to try to work out if it was likely to be a mistake or an attempt to play a completely different note. There are other things that could be um, incorporated duration and, and you know, whether you're playing the right note but in the wrong octave and stuff like that. I haven't played around with any of that yet. Anyway, you plug that into something like the Needleman Wunsch algorithm, um, which is one of those things I just stole from uh, Wikipedia. Um, and you get a result like this that essentially uh, has aligned the, um, the score with the actual performance of that note. And there's a lot of things you could do with this. One of the, one of the possibilities is that you, um, you can study, if you know, for example, the fingering, what fingers are used to play a different note, you can see if, if somebody is weaker in, in certain fingers than others by whether they're playing it uh, lighter on, on average. You can, but even more simply, you can just identify whether there are mistakes, whether there are notes added or removed. Now, in this particular example, I actually played it well, correctly in as much as I didn't add any extra notes or remove any. Um, but imagine that I'd played it wrong. I could do an alignment and then take something like this and feed it into Lily Pond, actually annotating um, the, the, the score. So in this case, I'll just play my deliberately incorrect performance So what I've done here is just indicated uh, a wrong note in red, a missing note in blue and parentheses, and a, a place where some extra notes were played uh, with that little breathing mark. So it gives you an idea of the sorts of things that, that we might be able to do with these alignments. Um, but other things you could potentially do, as I mentioned, is sort of view this as a unit test where you say, well, the person hasn't played this well enough to progress, or maybe they were making enough mistakes that they need to play it at a slower tempo next time, and once they reach a certain uh, score or whatever, they can move on to the next exercise. So that's Cherny, and uh, that's also available under a uh, MIT license on GitHub. Um, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm wanting to sprint on these. Cherny's, well, on, on Sebastian, Cherny's going to be a little difficult to sprint on because we don't have MIDI keyboards here. At least I don't know of anyone who brought a MIDI keyboard along. Um, but yeah, we're actually under time. And uh, <laughs> much to uh, Richard's amazement, and uh, we have some time for questions, I guess. Uh, so, at the start of the talk, you showed kind of the broad spectrum of you know, the the network the, layers, the, kind of thing. Yes. Yep. So, do you have any grand plans for? going further either way? The, so the, the, dealing, the dealing with audio is, an, is a very, very different problem and, and can be done completely separate. I mean, it, much like a network layer, you can really isolate these. So it's a very different um, kind of problem and one that I think others are adequately working on. So I, I don't foresee myself dealing with audio. I'll, uh, I'll keep it the, the, the higher layers.
I might have missed part of the talk, and I apologize if I did, but do you have any plans for, say, using Sebastian as a live instrument rather than to, say, code some music in the beginning? Yeah, I mean, that certainly could be used for that. Um, that's not my primary motivation, so it's not something that I've played around with, but certainly if somebody wanted to, to work on that and sort of being able to do, um, I don't know whether you could do it with like iPython notebook or something, be able to sort of be doing live construction of, of music, that would certainly be something that, that it could be used for. Hi, uh, great work, uh, really interesting stuff. Thank you. I was wondering if you thought about ambiguity at all, because... Yep want to get into this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that. and that's really the essence of why I consider underspecification so important yes. because so much of music is this ambiguity where a note might be playing multiple roles. It may be, you know, because it's it's this note in in one chord and a different note in another chord and that's the reason that you want to resolve from from this to that. So, I mean, one of the advantages of so you'll notice that I don't have any music specific Python classes in this, right? It's really just dictionaries and these sequence list-like things. And that was very deliberate because I didn't want to hard code notions of scales and chords. And I, I wanted it to really be about these dictionaries where you could say certain things. Um, ambiguity, I think, I mean, it's not something that I've explicitly dealt with. And there may be issues with the fact I'm using a dictionary so you can't have more than uh, one value for a key, you know. So there is details that need to be solved, but yeah, it's very much intended that you'd be able to handle that kind of both ambiguity on the one hand, under specification on the other, because that is absolutely crucial to, to music theory, I think. Hi. Um, how do you think these tools could be used to aid in musical composition? Have you tried, uh, like, using it? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think, so coming back to uh, the point I made at the start, that I almost view the score as, as sort of object code, I think um, what Sebastian would enable you to do is the, the, real, the, the real compositional output um, is, is Python script, so it's much easier to, to ma manipulate things in a more abstract way and have them uh, kind of trickle down into the final thing. So if you decide, I mean, w one really simple example is if you have some motif in your piece and you're using that all the way through and you decide, well, what if I want to tweak that motif? What if I took a different direction with that motif? Because Sebastian, um, hopefully, depending on the way you've used it, has captured that progression from how you started with that motif and modified it over time, you could make changes to that motif and effectively generate a new uh, piece of music, a new score, but based on a lot of the same processes and, and, and ideas. Hi. Um, so Journey is analyzing the way that you perform, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and you have data about how the performance is different from the score, but you could also have a difference between um, different renderings of the performance, so different yep. performers perform it in different ways and so on and so forth. Yep. Um, but given that you have this difference, could you use that difference to um, maybe play um, Three Blind Mice as if it were performed by right. Vladimir Ashkenazi right. or something a like absolutely. that? Absolutely. I mean, the, the challenge there is that unless I can get a bunch of pianists to play on MIDI keyboards, Right. That, I mean, there, there, is, there is technology, um, um, I think it's called Zenf. They, they actually, for example, they re-recorded they re um, the Goldberg Variations, um, the uh, Glenn, Glenn Gould's yeah. 55, they, they re-recorded it with a modern, modern recording techniques. Um, and the way they did that was they reverse engineered the audio into effectively MIDI and then played it through a, a, a piano. So. But yeah, I would absolutely love to build sort of a database of multiple performances of exactly the same piece to try to find those signatures of, of the way that different uh, pianists do. I, I would love to do that. It's a case of getting the data more than anything else. One of the failures of commercial music software is the lack of like good musical dictation. And obviously, when you have a copy of the score, it's a lot easier to kind of match it up and, like you said, use some dynamic programming to figure out where things go. Have you explored trying to use Turney as musical dictation? 
I haven't, but it would certainly, I mean, it would certainly serve that role well for exactly the reason that you give. If you know what's expected, then it's much easier to, to determine what is being, is, is being, uh, is being played. But I haven't, I haven't pursued that myself. Just a quick announcement for the audience, if you don't mind. Uh, we're having an open space tonight to talk about uh, music with Python uh, at 9 p.m. in room 212, if anybody's interested. And then uh, my question... So what, what time and room is that? 9 p.m. room 212. 9 p.m. 212. OK, Python excellent. in music. Um, and then my question, are there other libraries that you were influenced by when you were... I them? deliberately... Well, so this has been going for a long time. Uh, there are some excellent libraries, uh, Music 21 being one that I know of, but I haven't played extensively with it. And I know there's a lot of other stuff. Music 21 is interesting to me because it's, it's used specifically for musicology and so has, that, has a lot of knowledge of, of music theory in it. A lot of the tools I've, I have briefly looked at um, aren't at the level of, I don't want to say sophistication because that's not fair, um, they're trying to solve a different problem, they're less interested in kind of the, the abstract music theory uh, side of things. So I, I, Music 21 is the one I want to dive into more, um, others I haven't really found anything else that, that's, that's really grabbed me. Plus it's one of those things where I partly did this to explore myself and so I wanted to sort of... Uh, you know, go my own path in some respects before consolidating with, with other people that are working on this sort of thing. Okay, we're going to have to call an end to proceedings yep. uh, now. So thank you again, James. You're welcome.